paint. So there it is. Uh, so uh, first off, I'll just quickly say um, that analogical reasoning is an essential feature of the law. It's common in law schools and in the courts uh, to reason from hypotheticals. Now, hypotheticals aren't necessarily analogies, but they have features of analogical reasoning. Most importantly, that there are sets of facts uh, in a case or a set of principles within a case that we that people can test extreme examples uh, or test reasonable concerns. And so as a result, uh, as is the case in many common law countries, but also non-common law countries, we reason through the analogy, particularly through precedent. Uh, and precedent is the practice of uh, using a previous ruling uh, to guide a subsequent case. Analogy applies in this instance because a previous ruling may be based on a set of similarity of the facts or different features between the two sets of cases. Therefore, key issues associated with the law uh, and analogy um, uh, include, say, determining when two cases are considered uh, closely identical uh, or close enough uh, for precedent to apply. The second thing we might uh, ask is when two cases are similar enough for analogy to be relevant. And thirdly, understanding the reasons why the outcome of an earlier case should influence the judgment in a later case. Some of these, uh, these features uh, are some of the issues we'll be discussing today and the ones is particularly we will address with our speakers. I have three speakers today. Uh, we're going to do it in a 20 minute to 25 minute format where they will speak for about 20 minutes then we'll have 20 or 20 minutes or so to ask questions, uh, and then we'll proceed on to the next set of speakers. Um, if you want to ask questions, uh, the way that this will work is, first off, please make sure you have your microphones off, uh, but uh, ask clarification questions uh, in the chat box. We will be monitoring the chat. Uh, and that uh, at the end of the presentation, please raise your hand and I'll go around the room um, to, to ask uh, questions uh, to give you the floor. Our first speaker today uh, is Professor uh, Ann Herdigan, um, and uh, she is a senior lecturer at the University of Auckland, Waipapa Tamuda Rao, which is in New Zealand. Uh, so uh, welcome from across the world. Uh, she completed her undergraduate law degree at KU Levin uh, in Belgium uh, before studying for her LLM at Columbia University in New York. Uh, and she also got her PhD uh, at the University of Auckland. Uh, her research interests are in international law and international economic law. And so uh, she's working on a project on the meaning of good neighborliness in international law. And uh, her title of her presentation is The Persuasiveness of Domestic Law Analogies in International Law. I will stop sharing now. And uh, Dr. An, you have the floor. So um, thank you very much for that introduction. And hello from New Zealand, where it's nine, eight o'clock in the morning. Um, so thank you so very much for the invitation to discuss my uh, 2019 paper on the persuasiveness of domestic law analogies in international law. Um, it's a real honor to have been invited to talk to and with some of the scholars on whose work I relied on for my paper. So as David um, mentioned, my main research area is actually in international law rather than legal reasoning. So I thought I'd explain a little bit of why I wrote about analogies in the first place. Um, so about nine years ago, I embarked on a project on good neighborliness in international law where I wanted to explore what that concept legally requires from states, as it's often mentioned that states should be good neighbors to each other, but it's rarely examined what it implies. And so when I set up the proposal for the project, I intended to draw on domestic law to draw inspiration for international law, because good neighborly relations are really a concern of any legal system. And so I thought, well, what can we learn from private law systems um, and especially the restrictions they impose on private actors towards their neighbors? And to be honest, that methodological choice was not really something I had thought very deeply about initially. Um, after all, there are so many analogies between international and domestic law that it felt to me that this was a very acceptable methodological starting point. 
But soon into my project, it became clear that this methodology of drawing on domestic private law in particular, which governs interactions between private individuals, to develop the law that then governs um, internet interstate interactions, so between public entities, is actually more controversial than I had anticipated. So some international lawyers have described it as a sin, as reaching for the extra piece of chocolate. Um, so can we actually learn from domestic law or is it indeed a sin? So and while I could see arguments against the use of domestic law analogies in international law, I was actually not very convinced by sweeping statements that domestic law analogies should not be allowed at all, or slightly less sweeping statements um, that international law as part of the public law involving state cannot draw on analogies drawing from domestic private law that governs relationships between individuals. But at the same time, these analogies are so rampant in international law, we um, constantly analogize between treaties and contracts, for example, so that to me also indicates that in many situations they are indeed um, well, acceptable or they have at least managed to persuade a lot of people. Um, so the more interesting question then for me became what made some domestic law analogies suitable for international law and others not? And is there a way that we can confidently draw from domestic law in international law or where we have to reject it? So in other words, how do we assess any arguments based on domestic law analogies? So in trying to identify what made domestic law analogies persuasive, I drew upon the work that many of you will be more familiar with than I will ever be. So I'm hoping I've done injustice. Um, it was a very interesting um, sidetrack for me um, that I very much enjoyed, but I hope I got things right and understood things. Um, uh, otherwise, I guess I'll have to publish a corrigendum on my paper. Um, so, um, as many of you will know, there's kind of sort of three steps in an analogical argument um, to assess if there are indeed sufficient relevant similarities between the source and the target that then enable us to reason by analogy. We first need to uh, retrieve the source domain. Um, we need to map the similarities and then we can um, perform an analogical transfer. So um, I'm interested here primarily in the question whether a domestic um, concept is suitable for the international legal order. Um, the, I've called that the vertical question in my um, paper. The horizontal question of which domestic legal system are we actually going to draw from, um, which is a whole other can of worms, um, I've sort of avoided. Um, so it's really about what makes domestic legal systems in general, um, despite all their variations comparable or analogical to some parts of international law. So the first step, the source domain is obviously the, the really important one. And many of the arguments against domestic law analogies in international law really relate to this first step. Um, so the argument that they're simply too different is ultimately one that domestic law is not the appropriate source domain for international law. And there are undeniable differences between domestic and international law, um, mainly that international law lacks a centralized system of lawmaking and law enforcement. Um, although in some areas that is more developed than in others, but overall there is no global single government. But I actually argue in my paper that these differences are not enough reason to reject domestic law um, per se as a source domain um, of analogies that can be applied in international law. Um, at the same time, it doesn't mean that domestic law is um, an appropriate source for all concepts that might be needed in international law. Sometimes we just might need to, we might need to invent our own stuff. So instead of a sort of wholesale incorporation of domestic law in to international law or a wholesale rejection. Um, I've argued that we need kind of a more retail approach to international law that considers what the issues are um, at stake, 
um, the structures um, in place and also the relevant relationships. And to develop this, I rely on a metaphor of the geology of international law, which was um, developed by Joseph Weiler. Um, I use it for slightly different purposes, but... Um, and this geology of international law is kind of characterized by different strata that all exist at the same time and build on each other, um, which I think is important to keep in mind because sometimes we sort of think about international law moving along in eras and sort of the previous, the existing system becoming redundant, but that's not quite the case. So that first underlying stratum is the layer of coexistence where, so international law is about ensuring peaceful coexistence between states. It focuses on their horizontal relationships through rules of abstention, such as the prohibition of non-intervention, uh, the principle of non-intervention, the prohibition on the use of force and so on. And I argue then later in my paper that we have very similar um, rules in uh, domestic law, and I'll come back to that point a bit later. The second stratum is that of coordination. Sometimes the horizontal relationships between states require a bit more active intervention and simply do not do X, Y, or Z. Sometimes we need a bit more coordination and that's achieved through many through bilateral treaties. They are very transactionalist. For example, how are we going to provide cross-border telecommunications or even postal services, which are some of the earliest treaties that we've ever included. And these two strata are sort of the classical international law. Um, they were described in, um, I think, the late 19th century or early um, by one scholar as private law writ large, even though international law is addressed to public entities, like in both layers, both strata, states as the actors. But ultimately, these relationships between states are private in nature. They apply to actors who are legally equal. They have the same rights and obligations that are limited by reciprocal rights of the other actors. Um, and in and domestic law similarly deals with such um, relationships and limits the rights that are part of it. Um, it's through the law of obligations and property law that we achieve that people can sort of respect each other and their ownership. Um, and so these areas of domestic private law can thus be seen as an appropriate source domain for the international law strata of coexistence and coordination. But there are a few more strata. Um, the next one is that of cooperation. Um, so where treaties are not simply um, transactional anymore, but might take on sort of legislative traits to address common goals, such as climate change mitigation, protection of human rights. And often these treaties then create specific bodies that may be endowed with rulemaking or rule enforcement um, powers independent of the states. Um, and so as a result, the relevant relations are not just anymore the horizontal ones between the states, but also sort of the vertical um, ones between the state and the international body that they have created. And here, international law loses some of that private law nature, but starts moving into the public realm where it focuses on achieving common interests. And domestic law also deals with those relationships and powers um, through public administrative and procedural law. Um, and so I did argue that it's those areas of domestic law that can be the relevant source domain for analogies in the international law of cooperation. And then finally, we've got sort of the more modern um, layer of regulation where that verticalization that started in the cooperation stratum is kind of taken a step further in that we start seeing a link between the individuals um, who live within a state and an international body. And sometimes a state might mediate um, that link, but in other areas, such as, for example, in international criminal law, that is not necessarily the case anymore. Um, so, and when we sort of see that link emerging between individuals and international organizations, we're coming sort of quite close to recreating state-like structures at the international level, 
without actually needing any analogies coming into um, play. I mean, if we want to be sort of playing a bit with words, that's kind of a domestic analogy more than a domestic law analogy. Um, but that's again a whole other area um, that international relations scholars like to talk about sometimes. Um, but the choice of that source domain is obviously crucially important for the outcome of analogical reasoning. And it's a choice that should be justified and that can always be challenged. And, of, and ultimately what I'm presenting here is a possible justification of the source domain. And in my paper, I've identified sort of two examples where I felt that an analogical argument failed because the wrong source domain was chosen. And I'll mention one here. Um, so this goes back to um, the war in Yugoslavia and the aftermath of that. Um, during his trial before the ICTY, so the Yugoslavia Tribunal, Mr. Karadzic argued that he could not be prosecuted because during the Dayton negotiations, he had reached an agreement with Mr. Holbrook, the chief negotiator, um, whereby he Karacic, would receive immunity from prosecution. And he argued that Mr. Holbrook had the apparent authority as agent um, of the states with whom he was negotiating to grant such immunity and that they had a valid contract that was enforceable. Um, so ultimately, he says the ICTOI has to respect this contract. His appeal failed. Um, the um, well, it failed at first, first instance, it fails at appeal. And the ICTY argues that really the field of contract law is so distant from the question of jurisdiction in international criminal law that they are in effect that incomparable. So, in other words, I think that's just to, some to say that. Um, Domestic contract law is the incorrect source domain here to consider immunities from criminal prosecution, which is the correct outcome, I think. Um, jurisdiction of criminal courts sits within that cooperation or maybe even in the regulation stratum, whereas these contract type questions sit in coexistence and coordination strata. So if Karachi basically picked the wrong source domain for his analogy. Um, so the second step then, once we've picked this, the um, source domain, is to start mapping similarities and dissimilarities. And this is something where we need to be careful, I think, when we start mapping from domestic law to international law. Because in both systems, we have states um, as relevant legal actors. But that doesn't mean that they map onto each other one to one. Um, so. Sometimes the states under international law are actually more similar to individuals under domestic law um, rather than um, sort of states, other states. Um, and if you've got an international organization present in international law and you're trying to map the relationship, sometimes maybe the international organization will map onto the state and the states in international law will map onto the individuals in domestic law. So for an example of incorrect mapping, um, I came across a, a quote from a former Italian international judge and legal scholar who argued that in international law, we cannot analogize to specific torts or crimes because those are attributable to individuals and um, not to, um, not to um, states. And here I think you see that mistake happen. Um, and I mean, partly his argument is undermined by the fact that we do draw a lot on tort law um, in international law to develop the international responsibility of states. I mean, sometimes we go different ways, but we also, we have that sort of possibility of um, something equivalent to a tort when we look at the responsibility of states. So, we need to be careful with the mapping and really need to take those steps quite seriously and think what what the relationships are, what the structures are and how they all um, pan out and compare. Um, then we get to our final step of the analogical transfer, which is about sort of identifying the, the relevant similarities. Um, ultimately, is there 
uh, a similarity between what the in structure between in the relationship between a shared and a hypothetical similarity. Are there any dissimilarities that are critical? Um, Sorry, I made a little mistake here, but this shouldn't be there um, in my slide. My apologies for that. I'll go to the next slide where I've got sort of an example of a analogy that fails due to critical dissimilarities. Um, although I, I also cited in my paper as an example of a wrong source domain. And that's the analogy between property and sovereignty in the immigration debate. So to give you some background, it's sometimes argued that states can exclude non-citizens from their territory because a state's sovereignty is analogous to a private individual's ownership of their land. Private owners can refuse entry to anyone they don't want. And then the argument goes, well, by analogy, states can do the same with respect to private citizens of another state. And Professor Waldron in an article on this analogy rejected it um, correctly in my view. Um, he argued that um, the ownership conception of sovereignty is incorrect in the context of immigration, although he admits that it might be correct in some other con context to sort of consider sovereignty as analogous to um, private ownership. Although he doesn't quite explain why he thinks that sometimes it's correct to analogize ownership and sovereignty, and sometimes it's not. Um, he just says, well, I think there's something along the lines of a category mistake here happening. Um, so he sort of identifies it, but doesn't quite get there all the way. And so in my view, the reason why the analogy fails is because there is simply is a critical dissimilarity. It, what, if we start mapping um, the source and the target, we see that in both the, the domestic law individual is analogous to the state, in international law, they both have rights over a specific area. We call it property in domestic law, sovereignty in international law. Um, those rights in domestic law include the right to exclude other um, individuals from that property. In international law, that sovereignty includes the right to exclude other states from your territory. But when we then start talking about citizens of another state and whether we can exclude that, there is just simply nothing matching that in domestic law. So we've got a dissimilarity and it's a critical one because it's the, these um, C's, well, that, that part of the question that we want to answer and the hypoth hypothetical similarity we want to find. So um, in my view, that's where the analogy fails. That's what the, if I wanted to use Waldron's words, that's the category mistake. Um, obviously, that doesn't now mean that we have to allow non-citizens. It just means that their, their exclusion sorry, cannot be justified based on the analogy between sovereignty and property. So to wrap that up, um, why actually the domestic law analogies? Why analogize from domestic law to international law? I guess the most obvious point is, well, we do this to develop international law, and that's certainly what I'm trying to do in my good neighborliness project. Um, but there are other ways in which these domestic law analogies can be useful, or even where negative analogies can be useful for the development of international law. Um, a failed analogy can reveal that there are gaps in um, uh, international law um, framework. This is particularly the case for institutional gaps that we need to plug before a domestic law analogy can be persuasive. Um, that was long the case around contractual doctrines. So one of the most famous international lawyers from the last century wrote his PhD on private law analogies. And he said, well, duress and rebus extantibus, which are contractual doctrines, they don't apply international law. That was because we didn't really have courts to go to to apply to. We now have a court. And so since then, we see that that has actually all developed. Um, so um, another thing it can use, be useful for is to theorize a specific question. If we start linking, for example, sovereignty to property, that leads us to further questions and may, may provide further insights or not. But this is my very final point. I see I'm one minute over, I'm sorry. Um, ultimately, these analogies are always optional. Um, even the most persuasive analogy that survives all the three steps 
does not have more force than international law gives it. If states find that analogy is not the right way to go for international law, then they don't have to go this way. So in that sense, international law is the, the last word. Anyway, that's it from me. Any questions or comments? So, Joseph Blass uh, is a once and future researcher working at the intersection of AI and law. Uh, and is currently uh, a judicial law clerk for uh, the Honorable Joshua Deal at the uh, DC Court of Appeals. And he received his JD and PhD degrees from Northwestern University. Uh, he wrote his thesis on analogical modeling of common law, learning and reasoning. Uh, his research focuses on what it means to have computers to perform tasks that require an essential component of judgment uh, and I'll know it when I see it quality that can sometimes seem inevitably human. His AI research is focused on cognitively inspired models of legal, moral, and common sense reasoning. And his legal research focuses on the risk and potential impacts of artificial intelligence on the justice system. Uh, Joe, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so thank you for that introduction, uh, introduction David, and sorry about the tech issues. Um, my name is Joseph Glass. I'm gonna be talking about um, some of the work derived from my thesis. Um, and. As David mentioned, um, I have a background in cognitive science and a JD and PhD degrees um, from Northwestern. Um, and my AI research was focused on analogy and good old fashioned AI cognitive modeling for moral common sense and legal reasoning. When I say cognitive modeling, what I mean here is you have some sort of theory of how it is that humans reason about something and you build an AI model based on that theory um, to see whether the phenomena produced by the AI model uh, match what uh, the human phenomena are. Um, and that can bring um, predictions also back that you can then test in humans. So um, these systems don't provide any direct evidence of how humans reason, but they can provide indirect evidence. Um, and my legal research, as David mentioned, is on the impact of AI on legal systems. Uh, the work that I'm gonna be presenting today is derived from my thesis that I defended last year on an AI common law legal reasoning system that used analogical learning and reasoning as essential processes. So what this talk is really about um, at a high level is I believe that an analogy helps lawyers discover the content of law, meaning the rules governing some domain, through the process of comparing prior cases to each other, regardless of whether analogy plays a role in resolving new cases. And my work illustrates how a body of legal precedent can go from a disconnected set of cases to a set of uh, coherent rules. And I'm also gonna present one of the algorithms that I developed uh, for my thesis that illustrates this process. So I'll give a little bit of back background, uh, talk about uh, my theory and the uh, algorithm that I developed, and then I'll present a brief evaluation and discussion. So let's jump right in. The domain in which uh, my work is done is the common law. Uh, common law is judge-made law. So in common law systems like in the US um, or in England and other Commonwealth countries as well as others, um, later courts are bound by the decisions of prior courts that apply to the new case. Another way of saying this is that every decided case that's published becomes its own source of law that is then applied to future cases. And so common law reasoning is fundamentally precedential reasoning. Um, and one example of a common law legal domain is tort law, um, which is the domain in which my research was conducted. Now, there's been a lot of debates in the legal academy over the years over the role of analogy and the mechanics of rule learning in lawyers' precedential reasoning, um, and whether or not cases are actually resolved by analogy or whether they're resolved by rules and the analogies are sort of surface phenomena, perhaps, that illustrate um, that the case law is coherent. Um, but in the legal academy, when uh, scholars have talked about analogy, they've generally meant comparing some case you're reasoning about now to one or more prior cases. Um, and I see another role for analogy in legal reasoning, which is in learning about the, the rules that govern those cases. Um, this work is grounded in cognitive science, and so I'd like to talk about some evidence about uh, analogical reasoning in humans. We know that humans reason by analogy all the time, um, and that analogy isn't, although it is possible for analogy to be a deliberate reflective process, it can also happen uh, more automatically. Um, we know that analogy is driven by shared relational structure, which is to say what makes two situations analogous is not that they have the same stuff in them, um, but that the stuff in them shares the same relationships. Um, we know that 
when two cases that are similar are compared, that leads humans to develop uh, an abstract representation of those cases or like a schema of the relationships that govern those cases. Um, and finally, my work is grounded in uh, Dedry Gentner's theory of structure mapping, which uh, is a theory of how it is that humans compare and analogize and draw inferences from comparisons. And it states that relational cases are aligned with a preference for aligning relations. And then this alignment is used to project inferences from one case to another. I'm gonna give an illustration of this in just a moment. Um, turning to the computational analogy tools that my work is grounded in, um, first, my research uses cases that are represented in predicate logic. So um, these aren't you know, feature vectors um, or, or distributed representations, nor is it plain English, um, but it's a logical representation. So for a statement like the defendant threatened the plaintiff, uh, you would get five different uh, statements. You, you know, there's this person, a plaintiff is a person, a defendant is a person, there's this event uh, that is a threat being made and it is performed by the defendant and it is targeted at the agent. Um, and I'm happy to talk more uh, if anyone's curious about why we use this event representation in, instead of a more compact one, um, but it's not necessarily relevant to the talk. Okay, um, my work is grounded in the structure mapping engine, which is a computational implementation of Gentner's structure mapping theory. Um, and it is a computational tool for performing analogies. Um, so it constructs mappings between two structured relational cases um, according to certain constraints. And these mappings include correspondences, candidate inferences, and a similarity score. So if you have these two cases, your source case, Alex threatens Bill, this makes Bill afraid, Bill hides and Ezra has helped Bill. And now we have some new case that comes in, Charlie threatens Drew, this makes Drew afraid, Drew runs away. And we wanna know what Ezra will do when Ezra sees this. SME will uh, create a mapping between these two, establish the correspondences and use that to project the inference that in this case, Ezra is gonna help. Now we can use the structure mapping engine to create schemas from these comparisons um, using a tool called Sage. So when you're trying to learn about some particular concept, Sage starts with a library, a case library called a generalization pool. It starts off empty and it contains uh, schemas, generalizations, which are schemas of two or more examples that have probabilities for the statements in the schemas um, and outliers, which are unassimilated examples that can be merged with later. I'm gonna give an illustration of what a schema will look like on the next slide. Um, but the way that Sage works, that it forms schemas, is given, so, so the um, case library starts off empty, um, but let's uh, imagine that we've seen a couple cases, we've been learning about this concept um, and some new case comes in. So given that new case, the system retrieves the most similar case from the case library and compares it with SME. And if the similarity score is above a certain threshold, then it merges it into the schema um, and otherwise it adds it as a new outlier. Um, and I should mention that my research uses a modified version of uh, this system. Um, so just an illustration of a schema, let's say that in that prior case, it turns out that Ezra really did help Drew when Drew ran away from Charlie's threats. And now we wanna learn some sort of schema about Ezra's behavior in these situations. So we have these two cases, we compare them to each other and we get this schema that says, you know, you know A threatens B, um, and Ezra is gonna help B, both of those things happen with probability one, um, but with probability 0.5, B runs away, probability 0.5, B hides, probability 0.5, you know, A's name is Alex, et cetera. Whew, that's a lot of background. Thank you for bearing with me. I'm gonna tell you about the research that I did. Um, I have to give a quick disclaimer about simple examples, which is that I did my research on intentional torts. So these are things like trespass or assault and battery. Um, and this is a very well understood domain with clearly established rules. Um, and that's a plus for AI research because it means that you can tell whether the system is learning the right thing. But it also means that my examples are gonna seem incredibly obvious. And you might wonder why would you ever need to learn this rule? It's so obvious what the rule is. So I have to ask you to imagine that we were discussing an area of law that's sort of arcane and it's not clear where the rules are. Now, you might wonder why we need to learn rules from cases anyways, because don't cases announce their rules when a judge issues an opinion, it declares a rule. And my answer is, well, why do you believe what the judge says in the case? Because every lawyer has had the, well, maybe not every lawyer, but it's not uncommon to have the experience of 
you're looking at some case and it announces a rule and it says something like A, B, therefore X. And in this case, the rule is A, B, therefore X. In this case, we had A, we had B, therefore the outcome is X, okay? And then a little bit later at time two, there's another court that issues a decision that says, yeah, yeah, that earlier court didn't actually really know what it was talking about. It said that the rule was A, B, X. But in that case, there was also this factor C. And that earlier court didn't understand that the rule that it was really applying is A, B, C, therefore X. And in this case, we don't have C. So the rule is really A, B, C, therefore X, A, B, not C, therefore Y. And because we don't have C here, we don't have that outcome. And these things are consistent and like we're not, you know, changing the precedent. This is all the same, right? Um, and so the rule that is announced in the case might later be discovered to not be the actual precise rule that's governing. Now, as I was thinking about this and working on my thesis, um, I had the insight that despite, uh, uh, you know, our negative reputation sometimes, lawyers aren't actually computers. Um, when I was building uh, this computer system, I would reason about one case, and then I would clear the memory and reason about the next case. And I, I remembered that, you know, humans don't memory wipe. When you have some case and you pull another case out of like Westlaw or LexisNexis to reason about it, and you then move on to another prior case, it's not like you forget the first case, okay? So a, another way of putting the insight that came from this is that digging through legal case spaces naturally invites comparisons, not just of the case that you're trying to reason about and that you're trying to solve, but of the prior cases to each other, okay? So when you have, you have your new case with factors A, B, C, and D, and you find the old case that says A, B, therefore X, and another case that says it's A, B, C, therefore X, you're naturally comparing those cases to each other to figure out, you know, maybe the second judge didn't even get the rule right. And that process of comparison leads to abstraction, um, which is to say schema creation, and those schemas can easily be converted to rules. So the insight here, my theory, is that doing common law legal research naturally leads to rule learning as lawyers automatically compare precedents to each other and learn the rules through that process of comparison. And that process is an analogical process as cognitive scientists understand the word analogy. Um, so just to illustrate this, let's say you have this case, George walked into Hal's house without permission. George called Hal names, George likes the wire, George dated Hal's sister. Did George trespass on Hal's property? Okay, and you have your three prior cases here. Alex snuck into Bill's barn. You know, Bill called Alex names, Alex dated Bill's sister, whatever. Chuck biked over Dan's flowers, Chuck likes the wire. If you take just this case, and this is where the example is silly because it's obvious what the actual rule is, but if you took this case and you just compared it directly to the prior cases, you might say, I don't really know what trespass is about. Maybe it's about liking the wire. And if you like the wire, then, then you're a trespasser, okay? But if you compare these prior cases to each other, it becomes immediately clear what the case is about. A owns some property P, B enters P without permission, ergo B trespassed on P. And it's this schema, which is again, easily converted into a rule that then helps resolve the final case. And you can then go back and do the process of analogizing, or maybe it helps support the analogy, right? This, this is separate from any theory of whether the analogy is then used in directly resolving the case. Now I have to mention um, two big assumptions about the system that I'm about to show you that implements this theory. The first assumption is one that I know is wrong. Um, and it's that only positive cases actually contain the core of a legal claim, which is to say the only cases that actually contain the facts relevant to trespass are the cases uh, uh, where someone has trespassed, right? A case might be negative, not because of the facts that they have, but those that they lack. And so reasoning about a negative case means rejecting the conclusion that it's positive. Now, this is, this is not true. I know that this is a wrong assumption for two reasons. The first is that negative cases contain a ton of useful information that helps sharpen the category boundaries of what counts as a positive fact or a negative fact. But the other is that a negative case might contain a, a fact that negates the positive case. Right. So you could frame a positive case as being, you know, 
A owns property, B walks onto A's property, and B does not have permission, and that's a fact, right? B does not have permission. Or you could just frame it as A owns property, B walks onto the property, you don't know anything about permission. And then in the negative case, it's stated, well, B has permission, right? The, the, the fact that's present is in the negative case. Now, I um, elided this for my own research just as an initial cut in the um, in the, the domains that I was looking at. It was straightforward to represent these cases as all having their facts present in the positive cases um, and using those negative cases to sharpen category boundaries um, is going to be very useful future work, but it was not part of my thesis. The second big assumption is that analogical generalization in, legal do in the legal domain is going to strip away all irrelevant facts and leave only the elements core to the claim. So another way of putting this is if I go back to this example here, in all of these prior cases, the only fact that they have in common is A went onto B's property, okay? But if instead all of those cases, you know, happen to take place during the day, um, then, or, you know, all, in all of them, the trespasser liked the wire, then a system of pure analogical generalization might not realize that that fact is irrelevant because it's present in all of the cases. And so it might infer, oh, this must be a relevant fact. You have to like the wire to be a trespasser. Okay, so this assumption is that all of the facts and the schemas that are learned are going to be elements of the claim. Um, now, I think this assumption might be true because with a large enough case space, you should expect to eventually see a trespass case that occurs at night or where the trespasser doesn't like the wire. Um, but it's possible that this assumption is wrong, that there are some facts that are so overwhelmingly likely to be true that you've just never seen ones that don't involve them. Um, and if this assumption is wrong, then some other process will be necessary to clean up schemas learned from legal cases. Okay, so here's the algorithm. So I start by taking cases um, and that I, I collected them myself, these Illinois tort cases. I fed them through a language understanding system to get those predicate logic representations. And then I, I hold one of them out and I train on all the others. So I create schemas just from the positive cases. I discard the outliers, so we're left with just a schema. And the schema might look like this. This is a schema that was learned in my, in my research. Um, there's some owner who owns some property. The property is a piece of real estate. There is some trespasser who takes some action. That action brings the trespasser onto the property and the trespasser is now on the property. And therefore, this is a trespass. So we have the schema. And then we use the schema to create a horn clause, which is a logical rule, by installing the legal conclusion as the consequent of the rule and all of the other facts of the schema as the rule's antecedents. So now the schema has been turned into a rule. All right, now a new case comes in. The bank owns a parking lot. The parking lot is real estate. The plaintiff performs a driving event. This brings the plaintiff onto the parking lot. Um, and we want to know, is this a trespass? Um, in this case, by the way, it's the plaintiff. This is a real case. It's the plaintiff who's accused of trespass. It was a wrongful death case. A plaintiff drove a motorcycle onto a bank's parking lot at night and, and collided with a chain and died. And so the family sued for wrongful death and the bank said, we don't owe you anything. The plaintiff was a trespasser. Okay, so we have this case. It's actually that graphical representation is a useful visual way for us to look at it, but it's actually a series of statements. And we can query for the consequent of this rule given the statements and infer that in this case, yes, the plaintiff trespassed. On the parking. Okay, I'm going to present uh, just some brief evaluation here. Um, so uh, uh, I evaluated using hold one out training and testing um, on this and on two other algorithms that I haven't presented that did reason by analogy, either directly to cases or to those schemas. Um, and I compared it to baselines that are now woefully out of date because I did this research way back in the Stone Age of late 2022. Um, and so I compared to GPTJ, which is a generative uh, AI system that's a smaller uh, public distribution of GPT-3, like I said, Stone Age. Um, LegalBERT is a multiple choice system that has also since been updated. So I'm not going to present comparisons to these baselines because I think it's it's just wrong to use such out-of-date baselines. I would love to run these studies again using more modern systems. Um, but I will say this rule learning system that I presented correctly solved 47% of the cases. That might not seem so good until you realize that there's no concept of chance performance. So the evaluation wasn't just was there a trespass or not, right? It wasn't like a 50-50. 
uh, coin flip, it was the system had to derive its way to an inference of, you know, this person trespassed on this property by taking this action um, or to reject that inference to determine that the case was negative. Um, speaking of which, the system's 47% performance was driven by performance on negative cases, meaning cases where the person did not commit a trespass, did not assault the other person, did not batter the other person. Um, it got 33% of the cases where there was a tort committed correct, um, and 83% of the cases where there was not one correct. And I, I'm going to say a bit about what this means in a second. And I'll also just note that um, GPTJ did better on positive cases than negative cases, um, which which I'll also uh, discuss. So I just, just to break down this 47% accuracy, um, this 33% accuracy on positive cases, the simplest explanation for this is that the training and testing set was too small. Um, I only had 88 cases total across four tort domains, um, twice as many positives as negatives. And so I, I had like a pretty small number of cases. And I did this because I had to collect them by hand. Um, and then I had to uh, feed them through our language understanding system, which is a painstaking process. Um, and uh, it, it would have been simpler to simply uh, represent them by hand and translate them by hand. Um, but that also would have been less intellectually honest. And we wouldn't know whether or not uh, I got the results that I did just because I had made the choice to represent them in a certain way. Um, another way of putting this is that um, I didn't have enough cases where the trespasser didn't like the wire, as it were. And so it may well have been possible that if I held out the one case where the person didn't like the wire and I trained on all the cases where it did, it would learn, well, you need to like the wire, okay? I mean, the better example, the one that actually happened would be you would learn a rule that said you can only trespass if you're driving a car, for example. Um, uh, another possibility is that this assumption that I mentioned earlier, that analogical generalization alone is enough to create these clean legal schemas, is wrong. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, that, that, that's a question for future work. Um, on the negative point, um, I think the, the only real insight that I really wanted to say here is that um, the testing data that you use can mask issues with learning and performance. So if getting a case right involves rejecting some learned concept, then the best thing the system can do to get those cases right is to learn garbage rules that will always fail. And then you will have a 0% accuracy on positive cases and a 100% accuracy on negative cases because you'll always say, oh, the rule didn't fire, the case must be negative. And the flip side is that a large language model might do very well by guessing the defendant is liable because it's seen more cases where um, the defendant is the one that's accused of doing the thing. Uh, uh, and more cases where the person is actually found liable in the end. And in fact, GPTJ did do better. Um, and I'd be curious, and I would predict that um, the larger and more modern uh, large language models would, would do the same thing. In conclusion, I'm a little over time. Thank you for your patience. I presented a system uh, that can learn legal rules by analogy um, in a two-step process. First, by using analogical learning to extract information common to precedent cases and then converting uh, those schemas into uh, rules. Um, it's still an open question of whether analogical learning alone is sufficient to learn clean legal concepts. Um, and if you wanna check out my other algorithms that involve solving cases by analogy to prior cases and legal schemas, I'm happy to discuss them, um, but we also have a paper in last year's International Conference on AI and Law. Um, my thesis is also available online, but um, the paper is much shorter. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you. All right. Let me just briefly uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, well, uh, Professor Shower here. Professor Shower is uh, the uh, David and Mary Harrison Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. Uh, he is the author of The Proof, Questions of Evidence in Law, Politics, and Everything Else, published in 2022. The Force of Law, published in 2015. Thinking Like a Lawyer, A New Introduction to Legal Reasoning, published in 2009, and Profiles, Probabilities, and Stereotypes, published in 2003. They're all published through the Harvard University Press, as well as Playing by the Rules, a Philosophical Examination of Rule-Based Decision-Making in Law and in Life, uh, in 1991, and Free Speech, a Philosophical Inquiry, published through the Cambridge University Press in 1982, and The Law of Obscenity. And uh, Dr. Schauer, you can take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, delighted to um, 
be here, delighted to be part of this. Uh, uh, I should start by correcting you. Uh, I'm not a doctor, uh, not any variety of doctor. Uh, like most people who do what I do, uh, I have legal training uh, and uh, only that. Uh, uh, I sometimes dabble in uh, analytic philosophy, um, but uh, uh, I do not have a PhD, uh, which as I shall indicate in a moment, is something I am with some frequency reminded of at home. Um, so um, the work that I am going to describe um, is largely um, work that I have done um, in frequent, although not always frequent collaboration um, with my um, colleague, Barbara Spellman. Um, she is a uh, professor of law uh, at the University of Virginia and professor of psychology at the University of Virginia. Um, she is a PhD uh, from this department uh, and a longtime friend of this department. Oh, and by the way, my wife. Uh, so um, so uh, she's at another event. So uh, I will be doing this uh, by myself, but I want to make sure that she uh, gets credit for the things that I say that may be right, uh, uh, not for the things that I say that may be wrong. Um, so let me start by saying um, that uh, when we are thinking about analogical reasoning in law, um, I'm not entirely sure that we are only thinking or necessarily thinking about precedents. We're thinking about precedent in a looser sense. That is, it is fundamental to legal reasoning and legal arguments. That legal reasoning uh, and legal arguments are, let us say, secondhand practices. Um, that is, a good legal argument is not uh, that something is right. It's that something is right because somebody else said so. Uh, and uh, the somebody else who said so might be a, the drafter of a constitution, it might be a statute, it might be a previous judge, uh, it might be someone else, uh, um, but legal argument is largely about someone else uh, saying so. And we often use the phrase precedent to refer to the full range of earlier cases, earlier decisions that might give some guidance, that might give some assistance. Uh, but there's also a slightly stronger uh, sense of precedent, uh, recently highly salient in the context of uh, the most recent Dobbs abortion case. Uh, the classic view is that precedent is strongly constraining in ways in, not necessarily absolutely, but strongly constraining in ways that the full range of legal sources that we describe as precedents are not. Um, so I like to use the word precedent for uh, essentially identity. Um, that is, uh, at times, especially if it's framed in terms of facts, and not in terms of a question. We actually do have a case that is identical to some earlier case. I'll use abortion as, again as an example. Uh, the issue in um, the very recent Dobbs case um, was uh, not so much can this person get this abortion at this time from this physician in this place. Rather, it was the more abstract and general question um, of, uh, is it permissible for a state um, to prohibit all abortions? It's a little bit of an oversimplification, but once we frame it in terms of a question, rather than certain facts, um, then we might say that there will be some um, previous decision that addressed the exact same question. And one of the things that law frequently does is say, this question 
framed in the same way as it has been framed in the past has already been answered by another court and we have an obligation, not necessarily conclusive, uh, to decide it in the same way. That's a narrower and stricter sense of precedent than just everything, using everything that's out there from past cases, past decisions, and so on. So not so much for this talk, but I think that's uh, an important distinction to bear in mind. Um, that said, um, analogical reasoning has always been part of the um, literature on common law um, reasoning. Uh, there are lots of discussions of it. Most of the classic books and articles and so on about the common law make reference to analogical reasoning. Um, but the most important thing um, happened very recently. Um, the uh, among the very recent um, cases involving, Supreme Court cases involving gun control uh, and the constraints of the Second Amendment, um, we have uh, the case um, decided a few years ago um, of New York uh, State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. Uh, really dealing, it's the most recent of the gun control cases. And the decision for the majority was written by Justice Thomas. Justice Thomas is noteworthy um, here because he, along with a current majority of the Supreme Court, is a so-called originalist. Now, there are a couple of different varieties of originalism. Old school originalism um, said that decisions should be made based on the original intents, original intent of those who drafted a particular provision uh, and so on. Um, that has become unfashionable, uh, partly because it's embarrassing. Um, when the Supreme Court decided uh, Brown versus the Board of Education on school segregation in 1954, uh, the case was argued twice. Uh, and it was argued twice because the Supreme Court wanted guidance from the lawyers on um, what was the original intention of the drafters of the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment. Uh, and nobody liked the answer. Not nobody. The Ku Klux Klan might have liked the answer. Uh, but the answer was a very clear answer of uh, the original intent was not to desegregate the schools. Uh, and this is not a fuzzy answer. It was clear. That is, there were on the, um, in the congressional debates in 1866, 67, and 68, um, debates about this question, uh, somebody asked the question, does this mean that our white children will have to go um, to school with African-American children? Not the language they use. Uh, whereupon the answer by the drafters and chief promoters um, in uh, 1867 and 1868 was, no, of course not. Uh, so we know here and in other areas that relying too much um, on original intent um, may, might get us into trouble. More recently, originalism of the kind that Justice Thomas uh, and at least five other currently sitting justices believe in, um, is a search for original public meaning. What did these words, what, what did this phrase uh, mean at the time that it was put into the documents? That's Justice Thomas's view about originalism. It's shared by many. Um, and so then we turn from that to gun control. And if we turn from that to gun control, Justice Thomas recognized um, that what counts as a gun, uh, arms, uh, technically, since that was the, that's the language in the Second Amendment, is very different now than it was in 1791 when the Second Amendment was first drafted, in 1868 when the 14th Amendment 
in effect, incorporated the Second Amendment and applied it against the states. Justice Thomas recognized this problem, um, that lots of things that are arms now didn't exist and nobody even thought of them um, uh, 150 or 200 uh, years ago. How do we apply original public meaning or originalism in any form uh, across this huge span of time? Whereupon Justice Thomas said, the judici judicial task um, is not to identify a historical twin, but a well-established and representative historical analog. And because he used that language so explicitly, there has now developed in the last year or two a burgeoning new literature on analogical reasoning in law coming out of Bruin, coming out of Justice Thomas's um, explicit mandate to engage in analogical reasoning when we are trying to apply the Constitution um, uh, across um, wide gulfs um, of time. So having said that, um, let me identify um, two mistakes that judges might make in doing this. One is a mistake um, that um, we uh, identify with uh, just the, the recently retired Justice Stephen Breyer um, in, a 19, in a 2013 case uh, of no particular interest and no particular significance called Lozman versus the city of Riviera Beach. Lozman versus the city of Riviera Beach involved um, how Mr. Lozman's uh, residence was going to be taxed and the circumstances under which he could appeal that tax. So it turns out that Mr. Lozman's residence was a houseboat. And then the question is, um, uh, is a houseboat a house or a boat? This turned out to be really, really important um, because as a matter of federal jurisdiction law, uh, if this was a boat and not a house, a boat that operated on navigable waters, um, then all of the jurisdiction would be in the federal courts under so-called admiralty jurisdiction. But if it was a house and not a boat, then admiralty jurisdiction did not apply, um, and the state law of Florida um, would apply. Uh, that was the issue. Uh, is a houseboat a house or is it a boat? Um, and um, Justice Breyer, um, writing for the court, um, said um, this is a question of analogical reasoning. He explicitly put it in those terms. Uh, and then he committed one of the two mistakes that I want to talk about um, that uh, most of you will recognize as the mistake of relying too heavily on surface similarity. So what Justice Breyer did, and he actually put pictures in the Supreme Court opinion, is showed a picture of Mr. Lozman's residence uh, that showed that it was two or three floors tall, uh, had some number of um, windows in it, uh, uh, and that in addition to um, being moored to the dock and rarely, uh, if ever, moving, Justice Breyer said, look at this. This looks like a house and not like a boat. Uh, and a big part of the decision was relying not on relational similarity, not on structural similarity, but merely on surface similarity. I want to describe that as uh, mistake number one, uh, obviously uh, a mistake that courts might fall into in applying um, what Justice Thomas wants the courts to do uh, after Bruin. After all, there are lots of modern dangerous self-defense weapons that don't look like the uh, muzzle-loading muskets um, of 1791 uh, or even um, the weapons that were most common in 1868. 
there is a risk that a court following Justice Breyer and relying too much on surface similarity um, will say uh, the weapons that are now at issue uh, don't look at all like the weapons of 1791 or 1868, and therefore they are not covered. Mistake number two, attributable largely to the now retired uh, but um, quite prominent um, judge uh, and previously academic um, Richard Posner um, of um, originally the University of Chicago and then the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Uh, judge Posner, along with other scholars such as Larry Alexander and Peter Weston, uh, observe correctly that analogical reasoning requires that you come up with what I want to call um, a rule of relevance. That is, no two things are identical. Any two items in the world, uh, each of which contain an infinite number of features, any two items are similar in some respects and different in, uh, in uh, some respects, or analogous in some respects and uh, non-analogous in other respects. Whereupon Judge Posner, having identified this, then became much more of a legal realist uh, and said that entitles judges to do whatever they want to do because they can identify in the name of analogical reasoning, a relevant similarity or a principle of similarity that enables the things they want to use uh, as similar um, to be um, analogous and the things they don't want to use to be non-analogous and therefore come up with whatever results would be the best policy result, which of course Judge Posner thought was a good thing. The reason I describe that as a mistake is that it ignores the fact that judges have knowledge about things other than law, judges have experiences, uh, and it ignores the extent to which what you see as similar is not just what you decide will be similar based on the outcome you prefer, but what you see as similar is significantly a function of your own training, background, uh, and experiences. Um, so um, I'll give an example um, uh, for if you were to ask an ordinary lay person, what's the similarity between uh, the American Nazi party and the civil rights demonstrators of, 19, of the 1960s? They're likely to answer by saying nothing. That's an offensive question uh, or something of that variety. If you ask the same question of an American free speech First Amendment specialist, they will identify both the march of the American Nazi party and the marches and demonstrations of the civil rights demonstrators. Uh, as highly legally relevant just because they know history in ways that others won't. Um, there are lots of other examples of this. Um, we could add uh, some number of gun examples to this. Uh, and I want to end, therefore, with the proposition coming out of what I just said and coming out of the example that I've just um, said, that in order to understand how judges will apply what Justice Thomas wants them to do. We have to know what does those judges know about guns, know about arms, know about self-defense throughout history, and know about a whole bunch of other things that judges don't necessarily know about. Some judges will know a lot. Some judges will know nothing. Most judges will know something in between. They'll get a little bit of assistance from the parties, um, but in order for judges to do the kind of analogical reasoning 
that Justice Thomas thinks is conventional and routine. We have to know about what those judges uh, will know about the underlying uh, substantive topic that they are applying analogical reasoning to. Justice Thomas doesn't consider that. Um, perhaps he will in some future cases, um, but uh, when we, the case is too new to know how it will play out, but we, when we look at what judges will do, I will predict that judicial outcomes following Justice Thomas will at least be in part predictable by uh, judicial by the judge's knowledge of weapons, knowledge by guns, and not about guns, and not just knowledge about um, the law, and not just knowledge about the Constitution. Okay, I will leave it at that. Um, everybody else went a minute or two over, so uh, I don't feel so bad.